You guys should be able to hear me. Donna, can you hear me? Okay. Um, we talked about this three or four weeks ago. Um, it's odd. We all do this, and it's just so contrary to what our human experience is. We always do the why me, or why does good stuff happen to bad people, and bad stuff happens to good people, and and oh, that little Susie, she was so sweet. How could God let something like that happen to her? We all have said that. We've all heard that. We've all experienced that. Scripture never tells us life is like that. Look at what this says. The same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Peter's even saying, listen, don't, don't go, why me, why me? This is suffering is common to all of humanity. Why do we think? Any good thing should happen to any of us. I mean, life is filled full of ups and downs, constant ups and downs. Um, I, I just, you know, even though this is only going to happen to us for a short season, it still happens to us. So I just on verse nine, it reiterates what we talked about three or four weeks ago. Suffering is common to all of us. It is not something that should surprise us it shouldn't be something that we're like shocked at it's the norm do you guys get that all right peter's emphasizing that now let's move on to uh to verse 10 and he says but may the god of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by christ jesus after you've suffered a while perfect establish strengthen and settle you so first of all if you remember two weeks ago, I made a statement. I want to just reiterate it. Donna, Jim, Eric, whatever you're going through, this life, the valleys, the low spots, this is the worst it will ever be for you. You're in the low spot. Life is a series of ups and downs, ups and downs, and this is the worst it's ever going to be for you. This little smidgen, this little sliver of 20 years, 60 years, 80 years, 100 years, that's all. And then it's eternity where it's all ups, it's all mountaintops, it's all peaks and no valleys, all good, no bad. Now, have mercy and have pity on and have compassion on those who projected Christ. The people who want nothing to do with God, who spent their life stiffing on him, stiff arming him, have the same up and downs you have, except their eternity are all valleys. No peaks, no good things, because all they've wanted their whole life is to be separated from God. God eventually grants that request, and on into eternity they go without God. But if you remove God from the equation, what do you have left? Evil, hate, suffering, tears, hardship, loneliness. Go on and on. It's an all-star list of everything bad that you don't like about this life. You've embraced that now for eternity. So Peter says, we're going to just suffer for a little while. He doesn't minimize suffering. And you got to be careful with this when you're talking to people. Suffering is suffering. It hurts. It, it, it makes you cry. It upsets you. It, it, it's terrible. Suffering is suffering. There's nothing good about it. Jesus didn't say, oh, look at me. I'm suffering. Isn't this awesome? Suffering is suffering. But he, he, he doesn't minimize the suffering, but he does say, keep it in perspective. You're going to suffer, but it's just going to be for a little while. And then you have eternity with Christ, uh, with all the goodness and all the glory and all the awesomeness. And so he says that my prayer to you, my beloved Christians, my, my beloved brothers and sisters, my prayer to you is that after you suffer for a little while, God would perfect you, establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. So these are all things that God does, that he works through us, he works in us. All these attributes, all these characteristics that manifest themselves in us and through us as we go through suffering. Here's another good part of suffering. Suffering isn't good, but the outcome of suffering can be uh, perfecting your spirit, your soul, your character, establishing you, strengthening you, making you stronger, like a muscle that you work out over and over and over again, 
it gets bigger and it gets stronger as you stress it. Um, he settles you. He anchors you. He puts a foundation under you so you know you can go through anything because he's going to walk through it with you. So this is the process that Peter is praying for his beloved, his, his church. He's praying this for them. And it's our prayer for our, each other that as we go through sufferings, these goods will come out of it. Now, we know historically these guys would suffer. His audience would, in fact, suffer. But let's, not everybody does. And not everybody does all the time. I don't want this chapter, as we examine one thing, which is suffering well, which is the main message of this chapter, don't discount what the whole rest of the Bible says. Let's be mindful that God still works miracles. Let's be mindful that God still answers prayers. Let's be mindful that God still intervenes. Let's be mindful that God still saves. This is our God that we serve. This is our Father in heaven. This is our Daddy in heaven. And so in Breaking Bread, what we've always tried to teach is, listen, I don't know. I wish I knew God's will perfectly. Here's this little cake. I have no idea what this thing is. I put my protein bars in it for the morning breakfast meal. But, um, you know, I can see through it, and I can see through it pretty clearly. I, I, it's, a, it's a clear piece of glass or crystal or whatever it is. But our walk with the Lord is not described that way. It, scripture tells us that we kind of see through a glass dimly or darkly or opaquely. Um, our walk, we don't always know what God's will is in a situation, but I guarantee you, God knows how we're made. God knows our limitations. And it's not an offense to him that we pray. Dana, if you were to tell me you got a bad diagnosis and you asked for prayer, I'm not going to pray, well, God, please ease Dana's uh, a journey into the eternal because he's going to croak. And you know, you, what am I going to pray? We've always taught in breaking bread. We know we're limited. I'm going to pray the best and leave the rest to God. And it's the best is I, with my limited ability, my best that I perceive it is that Dana gets healed. So that's what I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that Dana gets healed. So you pray the best and you leave the rest to God. So I don't know what God's will is in every situation, but as a human being, I'm going to pray what I perceive to be the best in that situation. And then I'm going to leave the results to God. Because God still does do miracles. God still answers prayers. So just because these first century Christians are going to go through 250 years of persecution, that doesn't mean that happens in every scenario. Um, we didn't need to intervene and intercede for each other in prayer uh, when we get bad news. When persecution comes, we need to pray for each other. God tells us to do that. Um, does he always intervene? No, but I know that I, that's what I'm compelled to pray for. So, all right, moving on. 12 to 14. And this is, this is the close of his letter, and then we're going to go back to verse 8 and, and get to your main point. Um, he prays, he, he's, he, after he's done praying this prayer for them, he, he adds a personal touch. And if you remember from the introduction to 1 Peter, I mentioned a couple of things. I said the Greek that this is written in is very high Greek. It's very educated Greek that this letter was written, the, 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 the manuscripts, the documents, and everything they have. It's very high Greek. Um, probably not written by Peter. We don't know for sure. I fully believe these are Peter's words. But there's a word they used back then, an amanuensis, or a scribe. It would be somebody who would, you would dictate a letter to that perhaps might be better, uh, high, more highly educated at all. So when I mentioned there could be two possibilities for this. John Mark, who is the writer of the Gospel of Mark, he was kind of like Peter's spiritual son, kind of like how Timothy was to Paul. Uh, John Mark was... Uh, 
was similar to, uh, to Peter. Um, but I also mentioned a fellow named Sylvanus. And why did I mention him at the beginning? Because he's mentioned at the end. He mentions this Sylvanus as a faithful brother, and he's written to you through him. Now, that either means Sylvanus wrote this down, or Peter, and then Peter's writing the close in his own hand. We see Paul do that sometimes in his letters. He'll close the letter, by my own hand, I write this to you, greetings from the church at blah, blah, blah. So we see Peter doing something similar here. It's interesting, Sylvanus, you actually know this cat because he's sprinkled throughout the Bible. The um, Aramaic word for Sylvanus is Silas. Do you remember Paul and Silas mentioned all throughout the New Testament? So just a little bit of history. Um, John Mark, the writer of Mark's gospel, um, he's the guy that started out with Paul, not Peter, Paul and Barnabas. And they're going to go on their big missionary journey. And John Mark's the young dude that's coming along with them. And what happens to John Mark? He flakes out. He gets scared. He tucks tail and he runs. Now, later on, he comes to his senses and he comes back to them and says, please, I've, I've made a horrible mistake and I want to join you on this next missionary journey. Do you guys remember what happened? He broke up the dream team. Uh, Paul said, uh-uh, no way. You flaked on me once. Barnabas, always the compassion and encouraging one is like, no, Paul, we need to take him back. We need to give him another chance. And Paul goes, I'm not going to do it. And then they had such a sharp division over this. The dream team got split up. Paul took Silas, Silvanus, and uh, Barnabas took John Mark with him. And this same John Mark later became like Peter's apprentice. And I think the reason for that is look at the history of both men. John Mark, passionately, he could have been the young man that, in the garden that ran away naked when the soldiers came in to arrest Jesus. Many people think that that was the same John Mark. Um, but he gets scared and he runs away. And then he comes to his senses and comes back. Does that sound familiar? Peter denying Christ three times? Peter, the rock, Peter, the, the one that um, Jesus said, uh, you know, Peter, you have spoken this by the Holy Spirit, Peter. But he's also the same Peter that says, Jesus, you can't go to the cross. And Jesus had to turn to him, Satan, get behind me. Same Peter, same boo-boo Peter. So I think he can relate to John Mark because they both had very similar personalities. They got scared. They did stupid stuff. Um, and, and God gave them, you know, three times Jesus had to repeat back to Peter, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. He had to restore him. And I think Peter could relate to John Mark. So he, he talks about Sylvanus, and then um, he says, she who is in Babylon. I, I have an easy explanation for this. I'm not going to say it's not. It isn't without dispute. There is some dispute what this is talking about. Some commentators believe Peter meant that he was writing this from Babylon. But I don't think that's accurate if you dig deep enough. Babylon in the time of Peter by A.D. 62, A.D. 64, it's a little backwaters town. It's not the Babylon that you think about in the Old Testament, some grandiose epicenter of the Babylonian Empire. Babylon is a nothing little town now. It's just completely decayed into this. Babylon in the New Testament is frequently a, 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 an illustration, a symbol, a symbol for something. It means a worldly city. Um, you'll see it mentioned in the book of Revelation. So I think all he's saying here is Babylon is Rome, because we think Peter wrote this and actually was uh, killed in Rome. So she is a personal noun, and it's usually the feminine sense in the Greek. So she is the church. So the church who is in Rome greets you, and so does Mark, my son. 
So I think it, that's what that means as we get to the close of the letter. And now if there's no questions, I'll hold them to the end. Let me go back to verse eight. And uh, let me see how much time we've got. I think we're still good. All right. Your main point. Verse eight. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. I don't believe in giving a lot of screen time to the enemy, uh, but I do believe we need to be prepared. So like college football, we need to have a game plan. And so let's talk about this. Uh, I picked three verses that illustrate how mm, formidable your enemy is. First of all, he is your personal enemy. I used an illustration, I think, a week or two ago with Carol. And I talked about how if she were the only human being on the planet, Jesus would have gone through everything he did anyway because he personally loves Carol that much. I know there's 7 billion other people, and I know there's probably that many or more that have existed before. But somehow our God is so incredible, so huge, has this such capacity that he is all in on Carol 24-7, 365 days a year, from her conception until her death and on into eternity. He's got all the time in the world to spend with Carol. Okay, now Satan is not like that. Satan is not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. He's not omnipotent. But guys, let's understand who our enemy is. Ghana, you are a little sugar ant, and Satan is an elephant. Okay, you on your own, I'm going to be really clear on this, guys. None of us are a match for Satan. He is too good, too crafty, too strong for any of us as individuals. Just bookmark that thought. I said you as an individual. That's all I said. Now, that's your perspective. Ant, sugar ant to elephant. Okay? That's how strong he is compared to you. Let's look at the ways he comes and attacks humans. Psalm 91.3 talks about Satan coming against us like a fowler, F-O-W-L-E-R, someone who traps birds. He's described as one who is quiet and secretive and never wanting to reveal his presence. So he's crafty, he's secretive, he's disguised. Over in 2 Corinthians 11, Satan is described as someone who comes to us or could come to us as an angel of light. He could appear glorious and good and attractive. Careful, guys. Not every option that appears good is good because one thing Satan is very good at is deceiving us. You know, he's very good at telling 90% of the truth. And just that 10% that he's lying is enough to totally twist the meaning of something. So he's crafty, he's deceptive, he's secretive, he's quiet, he's cunning, he can appear good when he's actually got nothing but bad intent for you. And here Peter tells us he comes like a roaring lion, full of, of bluster and intimidation and loudness. And his goal is seeking to devour and persecute God's people. Look at how multifaceted this guy is. That's why I said, Donna, you're like a sugar ant. Look at how many ways he could come against you as an individual. Not even speaking about his power. Look how crafty and chameleon-like he is. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, who I quote from frequently in these teachings, wrote this. Satan can never be content until he sees the believer utterly devoured. He would rend him in pieces. He would break his bones and utterly destroy him if he could. Do not, therefore, church, indulge the thought that the main purpose of Satan is to make you miserable. 
Oh, he's pleased with that, but that is not his ultimate end. Sometimes he even may make you happy, for he has dainty poison, sweet to the taste, which he administers to God's people. If he feels that your destruction can be more readily achieved by sweets than by bitters, then he certainly will prefer anything which would best affect his end, end quote. So he'll use whatever tactic that he can use to utterly devour and destroy Donna, okay? So this is all bad news, guys. You've got a personal enemy who knows you personally, um, whose ultimate goal is to destroy you, and he's got every tool, that, not to mention his demonic troops, but he himself has so many chameleon-like capabilities. His power is much stronger than yours. This, well, what does God say that we're to do? Read the next section. He tells you, resist him, steadfast in the faith. What, that's it? Resist him? Resist him? The secret of spiritual warfare against the adversary of your soul is simple, steadfast resistance. Now, granted, Scripture in numerous places tells you to flee different types of sins. We see that in Corinthians. We see that in Timothy. Flee from this. Flee from that. But I, I challenge you, find anywhere in Scripture where it says to flee the devil. It does not. It says the opposite. Why would God, knowing we're so mis mismatched, hang on, knowing we're so mis mismatched with the enemy, why would he tell us to stand and fight? Why would he tell us to, be, to resist him and to be steadfast in the faith? Why would he tell us that? Because James also chimes in with Peter, and he says, keep your eyes on Christ, church. Resist the devil. And James says he will flee from you. Well, how on earth does that happen? How, does the, how do the tables get turned? Go to 1 John 4.4. 4. I'll read it for you. Here's the key. It's not Donna, sugar ant, against the elephant. It's the elephant against the all power of the cosmos. And the elephant doesn't stand a chance. First John 4.4 4 says, For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Jesus Christ, living inside Donna B, could utterly annihilate the enemy. Satan has no chance against you. Zero. None. Nada. Zip. You think of an elephant as big? Think of the entirety of the, the whole created cosmos against an elephant. An elephant is insignificant in power. This is the power of Jesus Christ residing in Donna, in the believer. And that's how Peter, that's how James can say, stand, stand therefore, resist the devil. He will flee from you. The power in you, we fail to recognize, church. The power in you is so much stronger than the power in the enemy. So when we stand against the devil, what are we really saying when we say that? The word resist, when we look it up in the original Greek, um, what it meant uh, is two words in Greek, stand and against. Peter is telling us to stand against the devil. Satan can be sent running from the lowliest of Christian who has Christ living in him. So how do we do that? Because if you listen to Charlie Daniels, he says, well, the devil came down to Georgia looking for a soul to steal. He was in a bind. He was way behind. He was looking to make a deal. And this young man plays a fiddle of, against the enemy's fiddle, and he's betting his soul for a fiddle of gold, and the young man wins. That's so ridiculous. If you tried to go up against Satan, by yourself, you would be utterly defeated. You're going to lose your soul. You're not going to get the fiddle of gold. My respect to Charlie Daniels, it's a catchy song, but it's not scripturally accurate. But the Christ living in you 
is all powerful. So let's play that out and then we'll close. What does that mean to me? Knowing that I don't have to flee from the enemy, knowing that I'm stronger than Satan because Christ lives in me. Let me play this out. I'm a first century Christian. I'm being persecuted. I'm praying, God, deliver me. God, deliver me. God, deliver me. And God is, is a, a Spurgeon called Satan, nothing more than a big, black, barking, mean dog that does nothing but drives you sheep closer to your shepherd. Now think about that. If he is a toothless dog who can't hurt you, he can't claim your soul, your soul is secure, he can't, he, all he can try to do is sideline you, what is the antidote? How do you defeat the enemy? Stay close to God. If you're going through adversity, you go to your knees and you pray that the adversity be removed. You pray the best and you leave the rest up to God. What happens if he doesn't deliver you? You go to your knees and you pray God give you the strength to get through whatever it is you're going through and to remain by your side, which he promises, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. If you stay connected to God through this, Satan will be defeated regardless of the outcome. It doesn't matter. I mean, it matters, but it doesn't matter in terms of your victory over the evil one, whether you um, are delivered from your persecution or your bad circumstances or whether you're not. It doesn't matter because in the, in the big eternal scheme of things, Satan, you want to defeat Satan? You want to make him look like a chump? Then, then do this. Stay close to God, regardless of the outcome, regardless whether you get delivered, whether your prayers are answered or not. Your prayer should also then be, God, pull close to me so I won't lose strength. And he promises he will. There's other places in Scripture that promises. He promises you he will. So, guys, you want Satan to go down in flames. Stay close to God. Stay close to God. Stay close to God. Football. Football season. Picture this, and we've talked about this in Breaking Bread before. Be proactive in this battle. This is a, a for real battle. For real, guys. This guy's an enemy of your soul. He's got all kind of tools at his disposal. Get serious about this. Picture a football game, and you're going, Florida State's going against the Gators. Do you think? that they're not studying game films of the Gators, looking at tendencies, looking for weaknesses, looking for strengths, knowing how to plan the game around that kind of stuff. Satan is studying Jim's game film. He's learning your tendencies, Jim. He's learning how to come against you. Should I come against him as a roaring lion? Should I come against him as an angel of light? Should I come against him as a fowler with secrecy and sneakiness? What's the best way to, to get to Jim and make him stumble and put him on the sidelines, get him on the bench, get him out of the game? I can't kill the man because his soul's committed to Christ, but I want him out of the game. And if you are aware that he's doing that, and gang, he is doing that. I can assure you, he is doing that. If you want to be prepared for that, then you need to know what are my weaknesses. Study your own film, guys. Look at your own film. What areas does he come against me in? What areas am I weak? And then build some moral fences. Get a defense going before the game even starts. Know what you have to do before the whistle blows and the kickoff starts. Be prepared. Take this seriously. It is a fight. But it is not a lopsided fight, Satan against you, a little sugar ant. No, it's the God of the universe against this little puny elephant, Satan, and he could squish him like a bug. So guys, understand you can easily win this game. You just have to be aware of what's going on and be diligent. Do you get that? You get that. All right. Dan, if you will take us off um, mute on everybody. I just want to encourage you, we, we closed this book out. Suffer well, my friends, and 
and try to, to be kind to others as they're being evil to you. Our world is filled full of hatred and finger pointing and animosity and, and just ugliness. I can't stand to watch the news anymore. And I don't care what network it is. It's all just belligerent and it's hateful. And, and God's telling us we need to love those that persecute us. We need to love those that hate us. It's not easy. But guess what? Stay close to God. Stay close to God. Stay close to God. That's the key. And there's all kind of fruit that comes from that. And in today's lesson, it was just about Satan. And just study the films, guys, and get, get a defense going. If you're, if you're men and you're tempted through the eyes about women and porn and whatever, if I go to the sandbar, I go to the sandbar with Shuggy. And believe me, she's a very good policeman of my eyes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but as a guy, I need that. I don't, you know, it's Fong City out there, especially with all the group, group down from Miami. It's Fong City out there. Um, guys need to establish these moral fences. I've told you before on uh, my laptop and on my phone, I've got an accountability software. And guess where it goes? It goes to my wife. You know, if I'm if I go on a page, it even mentions something that's inappropriate. Boom, she gets an alert. She calls me on it. Is that annoying? You better believe it's annoying. <laughs> but it, you know what? It's good for me. I studied my game films. I know where how he's going to attack me. I know where he's going to come against me. I I'm not subject to uh, online gambling. That's not a temptation for me. I don't like to swear. I don't usually have problems with my language. But there are areas that he studied my film. He knows, I know how he's going to come against me. He knows how he's going to come. And there has to be these defenses set up or else I'm going to be a sitting duck. It's just stupid not to be prepared. And ladies, I don't know. I mean, it's different for everybody, but you have things that you stumble with, you fall with, and, and you've got to know what those are. And you've got to have things in place to be proactive and ready to fight those things. And I see if you guys have any questions, comments about today's teaching and as we close out or about the whole book in general. It seems thank to you, me Lord. You did. I've got a comment. Yes, sir. I'm going to make. I've been thinking about it uh, for some time now. But I wanted to uh, to say that in view of all that is happening, uh, God is allowing to happen what needs to happen to accomplish his will. And we must trust that God is good, God is loving, God is just, and God is in complete control. That's for sure. If we rest on that, then uh, the world around us can swirl around us and we hold on to knowing what our God is up to. I'll put it, Jim. We just trust that. Amen. And that's that anchor and that foundation. Right. Amen. And boy, does it swirl, though. It swirls, baby. And it's swirling like crazy. It twirls. <laughs> I think I cut somebody off. Paul, did I cut you off or I cut somebody off? I'm sorry. Well, I was, I was just, I mean, just before when you first started this teaching, it was interesting that I felt like God kept bringing my attention to this book and just there's so much in it about suffering. And so I just feel like it's a great book to, to just read through when we're going through suffering, just to remind us of how we're supposed to be handling it and perspective to have. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't make it any easier <laughs> but it's to, to know the perspective, right? It does help to have perspective, though, and it does help to know that it's just for a short season. It doesn't seem short, though, sometimes, does it? Mm -hmm. yeah. There's one other thing I mentioned, I was going to mention, but on um, the football metaphor, and I forgot it, but just look at, look at your screen. I don't know if you, I put it up on that gallery view where you could see everybody's face on there if they had, they were, had a face on here, yeah. but you're, you're a member of a team. And you need to take advantage of that. That's part of your proactive strategy against the enemy is if you're trying to wing this by yourself, what I, I, I just couldn't help thinking about, you know, National Geographic or a Discovery Channel show and the devouring lion and 
how he waits for that one gazelle that straggles away in the back, away from the herd. And that's the one he's going to pick off. And I just, that imagery, although the Bible doesn't talk about that, that's the thing that came to my mind. And, you know, one of a good defense against Satan, um, actually it's a good offense, is to have uh, other believers, you know, sure. uh, in your corner praying with you as you go through things. Uh, that's why we need to keep connected and we can't just try to do this uh, walk with Christ all by ourselves. It's, we need each other. Mm -hmm. Man. Along those lines, are we still using Slack to communicate our prayer requests to each other? Or how, how, does, how are we going to do this? I don't have any. I mean, I still have it, Dana, but I haven't, I haven't been using it since, uh, since I moved down here. Um, could I take a moment and tell a prayer request? Yes, you have a minute and 40 seconds before I'll we get booted off. Quick. Some of you may know I've been dealing with heart issues during this whole virus thing. In fact, I was admitted to the hospital. Heart was shocked and stopped for AFib. When we started. My heart rate has been an issue. It's been extremely high, but it's coming down. Uh, the doctor is pushing me to go in the hospital, and I do not want to go for obvious oh, reasons. Oh, yeah. And I have yep. a, a doctor's appointment this Friday, and I need wisdom. Okay. That's it. Very simple. I. I've been documenting my own heart rate, my own pulse rate. Things are doing well, but I just don't want to go in the hospital. I'm, I'm actually scared to not go in the hospital and being admitted for, he said, two or three days. <laughs> so, guys, can you remember Dana for this week, please? Yes. Yes, pray you. for him that he would have wisdom and that, obviously, I'm going to pray for his heart situation to be healed. Yes. Yes. And then it's a, then it's a non-issue. That's um, exactly what I've been praying. I don't know how okay. prophetic you were talking earlier. I go, wow. <laughs> it's like All right. a prayer request. Thank you guys for praying for me. I yeah. will uh, close us out. We'll be gone next week, but we'll pick up in Second Peter the week following. Goodbye, Dana. Goodbye, Donna. Goodbye, Eric. Carol. Goodbye, Marty. Goodbye, Jim. Goodbye, Ned. Goodbye, John. Goodbye, Gordon. Goodbye, Paul. Goodbye, Muzz. Goodbye, Kay. Goodbye, Dan. And goodbye, Silent Ron. All right. <laughs> and I think we made it. Yes, we did. All right. And, and Satan didn't win on the internet. The second part was fine. <laughs> and prayers for safe travels for you. Uh, thank